Well, I'm very interested in questions of literature and place and how literature with heightened intensity can show us the environments that we live in and remind us of maybe what the world used to look like and the sorts of things that people loved about their environments in the past. If you think about uh, Wordsworth's poetry or Emily Bronte's ecstatic images of what it was like to be on the moors, even further back into the medieval period, Gawain and the Green Knight gives us these wonderful descriptions of a landscape that's both real and unreal, fantastic and also fiercely physical. So I'm interested in those connections between literature and place and in our time obviously any consideration of place and nature and environment has to bring along with it questions about an environmental crisis, about loss, uh, about the loss of biodiversity and about the loss of our connection perhaps with those landscapes, that nature that the writers of previous generations just took for granted. Literary criticism has recently begun to take a lot of notice of environmental politics, uh, of debates about what nature is, what nature means to us, about the, uh, whether there's such a divide between nature and culture, maybe also how questions of language and representation affect the way that we think about nature and the kind of policy that we therefore make about it. And so a new field, which is sometimes called eco-criticism or geo-criticism, has emerged in literary criticism. So I've written about children's literature which is set in London or New York and the way that green spaces in those cities appear in books for children. Uh, we're well used uh, in children's literature to coming across those idyllic pastoral landscapes, the kind of thing that we find in Kate Greenaway's images or maybe a hundred acre wood, wonderland, neverland, the, the kind of places that actually were very popular in Edwardian and Victorian children's literature and which now perhaps for us stand in as a kind of idealised natural world that uh, we think children should belong to somehow naturally or that we ourselves would like to escape to. The ideology of representations of nature in children's literature, what is it that we're asking children to connect with? Uh, do some of these books for children, like uh, the Winnie the Pooh stories, uh, do they idealise the natural world? Do they expect children to have an immediate uh, and natural connection with the natural environment? How might they register unease or maybe even fear of the natural world? And how are contemporary writers trying to represent the fears about environmental crisis to contemporary child readers? How can we talk to children about climate change? Can we do so through their books? What kind of stories can we tell them about this new world that we're living in? There has been a tradition, hasn't there, of thinking about the two cultures. Uh, C.P. Snow's famous idea that there were, there were the arts and the sciences and that the two couldn't really meet. But I think latterly, and I'm, I'm quite optimistic, and I think it's something that we can feel reasonably hopeful about, is that the sciences and the arts have got much better about at speaking to each other. So we have a whole field called medical humanities now, we have the environmental humanities, which are places in which artists, critics, philosophers, historians, geographers are meeting and talking with their colleagues in the sciences to come up with answers or new ways of thinking about the problems which are of course affecting us all. I think the new nature writing is one place where we're seeing that coming together a lot and there's an immense uh, interest and it's very popular within, uh, amongst a very wide readership. It's certainly very interesting that environmental NGOs like the RSPB or the National Trust are putting a great deal of uh, passion and focus into children's experience of the environment at the minute.